Us this morning, lovely to see you here, uh, and uh, hopefully some people online as well. Uh, good that you can join us as well. Uh, my name's Andrew. I'm one of the elders here, uh, and uh, we've got a bit of a different service this morning because our Joshua uh, is over in the states. I don't know if you're up early watching. If you are, hello. If not, hope you're sleeping well. Uh, so Josh is over there uh, depositing ransom at uh, his new college uh, over in the States. Uh, and we've got another Joshua uh, with us uh, this morning, uh, Josh Fortune, uh, who's sitting at the back there. You may recognize the name uh, because he's uh, been scheduled to be our speaker for our breakaway week weekend for about two years now. It's one of the, probably the longest anticipated breakaway that uh, we've ever had. Uh, so hopefully Breakaway 2020 is taking place in 2022, and Josh will be with us again for that uh, up in Northampton. Right, so uh, what else have we got? We've got lots of notices uh, this week. Uh, it is, of course, a bank holiday week, so there's no prayer meeting tomorrow evening. Uh, but the home groups on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are meeting as normal. And then next week, of course, it's back to school, isn't it? Are you excited to get back to school? Yay! Well, the parents are. Yeah, it's done over the children. Yep. Uh, so back to school and then back to Little Blessings, our toddler group, uh, on Monday mornings, which is good. And if we skip to the next one... Uh Yep. So we have also got uh, uh, some important changes that we're planning to the constitution of the chapel. So if you're members, you may know about this from our, our members meeting a few months ago. And in the run up to that, we've got a number of meetings. We've got a deacons meeting uh, on Monday the 6th up here at the chapel. We've got a trustees meeting on Zoom. So if a deacon or trustee, uh, bear those in mind. And then a chapel members meeting on the 27th of September, uh, where we're going to be uh, sort of going over what, uh, what changes we're proposing. Important if you're a member to come along to that so that you can follow what's, uh, what's happening. And then in our normal meeting in November, there'll be some votes on that. Uh, and then another one has snuck in there between those two meetings. Of course, uh, Gracie, um, most of us will know Gracie Scott. Uh, she's getting married to Elliot uh, on Saturday the 11th. Uh, so the service is at uh, 1.30. Everyone's welcome to the service up here. Should be a great time. She's also my niece, so that's lovely. Yep. Good.
Good. Uh, and finally, before I let the band uh, carry on with our worship time, uh, we've got our idea magazine. This is the magazine of the Evangelical Alliance that uh, we belong to. Uh, so there's a couple of copies at the back there and this one here as well. This time, it's, uh, the theme is called to be home in a divided world. And I've just lost my place and I've found it again. So there's various articles on, uh, uh, on dealing with, uh, with unity issues in the church, which are quite interesting. Some uh, uh, make you think uh, theologically as well, which is always a good thing if you ask me. Uh, but there's this thing caught my eye, a million testimonies written in stone. I don't know if anyone's, uh, anyone's ever heard of this before. First, I'd heard of it. It's basically, it's a project uh, to build this, uh, the band can look at that as well, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a kind of infinity loop uh, made of a million bricks, each one representing a prayer. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, that's built uh, somewhere just outside Birmingham, I think. Uh, and I'm going to be starting some of the groundworks uh, in a couple of months' time. So that's an interesting project to bear in mind in your prayers. There's even a website, but then everyone's got a website. Okay, have I forgotten any notices? Probably. Probably. Okay. <laughs> right, good. Right, well, thank you very much. Back to the band. Right, <clears throat> shall we stand? We are free from sin forevermore. He's our rescuer.
that you've done, we will pour out our loves, will be a random song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one of hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we There's grace for the guilty, help for the needy. Jesus, you satisfy our souls. Strength for the weary, hope for the grieving. Jesus, you satisfy our souls. He Oh my 
Let's just come before our Lord in prayer. Precious Jesus, there is none like you. And we just worship you this morning because of your uniqueness, fully God and fully man and fully our Savior. And we thank you and praise you and bless you for that. And thank you that we can have that knowledge and thank you that we can worship you in freedom and in peace in this place. And thank you that we can, we can join from wherever we are in the world to worship you. And we thank you that throughout this world, people are indeed gathering physically and virtually, I guess, to worship your name. And we pray that whatever else happens this morning, that our eyes would be turned to you, Lord Jesus, and away from all the, the troubles and trials and even the joys and the happinesses of our, of our lives, as we remember that Christ is our treasure. We thank you for the summer holidays. We thank you for the times of uh, re resting and relaxation and refreshment that many of us have been able to have. We pray for those who are maybe still away in their holidays that uh, you would be with them and bring them back uh, safely home. And be with us as uh, we start to return to our normal routines with the, the end of the holidays coming soon and school returning. Especially be with those for whom uh, this, uh, this season will bring changes. We think especially of Ransom as he starts his new college in the U.S. Uh, and living with his grandma out there. We pray that he would be conscious of your presence and that uh, you would bless him and help him quickly to be able to establish some good friends there and to enjoy his time at that college. And we pray, of course, for his family, for Erdane, for Joshua and for his uh, his brother and sisters, that uh, you would help them also to adjust to, to life without him uh, back here in Fairfield. We pray for those also who are moving, uh, perhaps not so far, but moving up uh, to new schools or colleges uh, in the, the new academic year. And we pray you would help them also to settle quickly into their new routines and into new friendship groups that will be, be truly helpful for them. And even for those uh, who are starting new jobs, uh, we pray that you would help them to settle in quickly to get to know the people and the job and what they have to do and to know your blessing and indeed to be a blessing to others in their new work. And as life has to some extent returned to, to normal for, for most of us over the last months, we pray that you would uh, give us continued protection against uh, COVID, Lord, and against the, uh, the ravages that, that disease can have in many people. We pray that you would give us wisdom both individually and as a church and as families and uh, give wisdom to our government to know uh, how to tackle what we hope are the last stages of, uh, of fighting this disease. And we pray that you'll be with those who even today uh, are struggling and even today are, are helping those who are struggling in hospital or caring for them at home. We thank you, Father, for the peace and the safety and the freedoms that we do have in this country that so often we take for granted. Maybe perhaps we appreciate them a little more, having not had so much freedom for, uh, for a while. Uh, but even in that, uh, that lockdown, we had so much peace compared to so much of the world. And our thoughts, of course, turn at the moment to Afghanistan, Lord. We pray especially for your people there, for Christians who are still in that country. Uh, we pray that you would give them protection give them wisdom, give them courage, give them love, that their lives would speak out to their friends and their neighbours there. And we pray that the light of your gospel would somehow still continue to shine in Afghanistan, even under the rule of the Taliban. We pray that your love, your hope, your peace, your forgiveness will be seen. And that those in Afghanistan and indeed those refugees who come into our country would not be confused with the post-Christian Western values that uh, are so often seen in the media, which are really nothing to do with Christianity. But we pray that those refugees that come into our midst would be shown true love by you, that your people would step up and uh, welcome them into communities and share with them your gospel as well as their lives and as well as what practical help that they need. So that throughout the world it would be seen just what a saviour we have in Christ, what a hope we have, what a love we have. What a story we have to tell that is so different to that of the Taliban, of ISIS, or even of moderate Islam. A story of how the Lord God came into this world, became, became incarnate, became our saviour dying on the cross for us. We pray that that story would go out in power and that you would save people, that you would bring people to, to a knowledge of, of you as their saviour and Lord. 
We thank you, Father, for the service. We thank you that we can uh, hear your word preached in a few minutes. And we thank you for Josh, who's come up from his home church in Woolwich. We pray you'd bless his ministry there and bless his ministry uh, and his time with us here as well. And we look forward to uh, spending more time with him in, uh, in March. We pray that that will be able to go ahead next year for our breakaway weekend. And we do thank you for all that we can learn in your word. We thank you for all that we can learn of your provision for us, that you do indeed provide everything that we need, that uh, there is nothing uh, that we lack if we have you. And we pray, Father, you would open our eyes to that treasure, uh, that we would, uh, we would not be worried or upset, but that we would be confident in you and in all that you've done for us. So bless the rest of the service now, we pray. Bless the children as they go up to, uh, to learn of Goliath and of David and of his, uh, his triumph there through, through you and through your inspiration. And we do pray you bless them also. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, so the children would like to make their way upstairs. Uh, I think uh, they'll be building a Goliath today. Uh, we've asked Mark to come and take a reading. We're taking a break from, uh, from 2 Timothy, which we're working through at the moment. Uh, so we're going to look uh, at a passage in Matthew 6. So thank you, Mark. Do not worry. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be here with you this morning. Um, I know, uh, like we said at the beginning of the service, it's been a, a few years in the making, and I um, look forward to, God willing, that weekend with you next um, Easter time. Um, thank you, uh, especially for the prayer about Afghanistan as well. It's been um, much on my heart. I think many of you know that I lived in Afghanistan for three years. Um, I used to be a soldier. I was a paratrooper in the army, uh, and then I got injured. Um, in a parachute jump and I hurt my knee and then I went and lived in Afghanistan for three years uh, going on operations with the troops, um, filming what was going on. Um, I spent a lot of time with the British uh, soldiers and the US Marines in Helmand and I lived on the airbase that's been the focus of the, the gaze of the world for the last two um, weeks. I, I lived there for close to two years and it was in that airbase that the Lord called me to be a pastor and I preached my first ever sermon there. So it was, it's been really heavy on my heart just seeing all the scenes uh, that have gone on in the last couple of weeks. And um, yes, yeah, so I've got some friends who are there. Some have escaped. Some are still trapped there. So please, especially the Christians, please do remember them uh, in prayer because uh, it's going to be pretty tough for them. But I, I also read this week that the two fastest growing churches in the world are Iran and Afghanistan. And it's lovely to see that as the grip of the enemy titans it cannot extinguish the gospel and the Lord will, um, yeah, the Lord's kingdom will be built and the Lord's kingdom will be spread. 
Um, I'd also like to apologise because Joshua did tell me, um, it was a few weeks ago, we're in the middle of a house move at the moment, so my brain is all over the place, and also with the Afghanistan stuff, I've really been at sixes and sevens, and um, I think you've been working through 2 Timothy, and I was supposed to preach from that, but I prepared something completely different, forgetting that, so I apologise, and I've, I've sent Joshua a text saying sorry. But today we're looking uh, from Matthew 6, this was a, a passage which was actually um, a, a tremendous help to me in Afghanistan when we'd go out on patrol and you didn't know whether you were going to come back or not whether you'd be blown up or or shot and as you can imagine there were many reasons to worry when uh, one was serving over there but the Lord used this passage again and again um, to comfort my heart and to remind me of how he can be trusted so I wanted to just bring a few thoughts to you from Matthew 6 25 to 34 but before we come and look at this let's just commit this uh, time together in prayer <coughs> Father God we thank you so much for your word Lord, we thank you that your word is timeless, that throughout the centuries, men and women all over the world have had their lives changed by your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is growing and spreading in Iran and in Afghanistan right now. Lord, we pray that as we come to look at these reasons why we shouldn't worry this morning, Lord, you know all of us in this room can be prone to worry at different times about different things. Lord, speak to us now encourage our hearts and help us to trust in you lord we ask this in your name for your glory be with us now amen worrying is something that we've all done isn't it and it's something that we are going to be tempted to do in the future maybe even tonight you're going to be tempted as you're lying in bed to start worrying like was mentioned earlier we're about to enter a new season aren't we for some it's a new school. My oldest son, Jacob, is going to secondary school for the first time this week. Maybe start it, starting a new job or a time of year. Maybe you're just worried about the state of the country. I know uh, many trying to get doctor's appointments where we are in London. It's very difficult. You know, the A&E wait times have gone up to like eight or nine hours now. The NHS appears to be creaking. Money appears, it, money is a big one for many people, isn't it? your job situation, your financial situation, the impacts of Brexit on this country. We can worry about the way we look, our children, our families, our jobs. And people come up with all sorts of ways to try and deal with our worries. There are so many self-help books, so many YouTube videos. There's TED Talks about dealing with anxiety. I typed the word worry into Amazon just to see what would come up and there are hundreds of pages of self-help books and all sorts of guides and things to help you with worry. But the truth is, is that if there was one way to deal with worry, there wouldn't need to be a hundred different books and YouTube videos, there would just be one. Because everybody has their own opinion on how we are to deal with worry. Well, this morning, we can close our Amazon browser windows. We can turn off the TED Talks on YouTube because we do not need those things to tell us how to combat worry. We need 10 verses spoken by the Son of God. And so from today's text, I've picked out seven reasons why we should not worry as Christians. The word worry, I don't know if you knew this, but worry comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word which means to choke or to strangle. And that's what worrying does, doesn't it? I'm sure for anyone that's ever allowed worrying to take root in their hearts and their minds, it begins to choke you and everything else uh, that you, you know, are trying to function and do becomes harder because you're feeling so burdened and of course doesn't don't so many people know that worrying can begin manifesting itself in all sorts of ways it's funny when I came back I came back from Afghanistan after being there for three years in 2012 ish roughly and I thought I was fine you know I, I didn't struggle at all I had dreams about it like but not you know the, the conventional nightmares of waking up sweating but a few, a few years ago I just started to get like anxiety attacks when my heart would start racing and I'd feel like really on edge and I didn't understand what was going on and I realized that actually you know part of my job because I was the head of a course at university as well as the the memories of Afghanistan I think were combining together to 
um, have real, a real effect. And I really had to work through that problem with the Lord because I, I hadn't been expecting it. But worrying can have a, all sorts of effects on our minds and our bodies. Well, let's look at what the Lord says about worries. And like I say, I've picked out seven reasons why we should not worry from today's text. So let's look at verse 25 to start with. And um, again, I don't know if it's on the screen. No, <laughs> if you have your Bibles, get up in front of you. Um, again, it's my fault that I didn't, um, I didn't prepare from the right text. So verse 25, look at what Jesus says here. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. This is the first reason. We shouldn't worry because Jesus commands it. That's the first reason. We shouldn't worry because Jesus commands it. Think for a second. How many commands given to us in God's word are idle? How many of the commands are given to us just because God felt like giving them uh, to us that day? Of course, none of them. Every single one of the commands that God gives in his word, either to his people in the Old Testament or to us in the New Testament, are designed for the good of those who hear and obey. Isn't it a common misconception that we think that God, or so many people in society think that God is some divine spoil sport and he's out there just to ruin the things that we want to do and are fun, whether it's the way we spend our money, the relationships that people have, so many accuse God of trying to prohibit them and to ruin their fun. And yet can't all of us in this room who have ever trusted and obeyed God in matters of relationships, in matters of money, in matters of faith, can testify how blessed it is to follow God and obey him. Because God does not give us commands to hurt us. He gives, them, he gives us commands because he wants the best for us. And so Jesus gives us a command here. I say to you, do not worry. Why would Jesus command us not to worry? Well, notice that in, in this verse 25, he says, therefore, I tell you. Now, I'll just read out the verse that's come before, because when there's a therefore in the Bible, we know it's linked to what's come before. Verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Greek word here for money is mammon, which can mean more than money. It can mean stuff, possessions, wealth. And Jesus is making the point that you cannot serve God and your bank balance. You cannot serve God and your possessions, your car, your house, whatever that is. And you notice how Jesus goes from serving two masters to then talking about worrying. Why is that? Because isn't it so true that when we have another master sitting on the throne of our hearts, whether that's our careers, our families, our homes, our health, then we're going to start worrying. Jesus is telling us that you cannot have both God and stuff ruling over you. Let me ask you today, if you were to look in your heart, perhaps what is it that you think about whenever you have nothing else to think about? That's often a good sign of where our hearts really are. What is it that you look forward to that gives you hope and comfort? Is it the Lord? Or is it maybe the stuff that you own or the money that you make? Jesus knows what is best for us. And he knows that worrying is not good for us. Now, we'll go and see a little bit further on in verse 30 that worrying is actually showing a lack of faith. So, again, he knows that worrying is not good for us. So, that's the first thing. Jesus commands us. Now, to be honest, that should be enough. Okay? If Jesus says, don't do something, we should say, Lord, I trust that you know the best for us. That's good enough for me. But you know what? He gives us six other reasons. He's very gracious. Look at the next one. He says, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Reason number two, isn't life more than this? This thing that you're tempted to worry about, Jesus is saying, life is more than that thing. Have you ever noticed how a worry 
or anxiety can make you tunnel visioned. You get so focused on that problem that you lose sight of everything else. And Jesus is saying, stop, stop. There is more to life than this. And to be fair, he's talking about food and clothing, you know, things that we really, really need. And he's saying there is more to life than this. My friends, there is more to life than the things that we worried about. Despite how tunnel visioned and fixated we can get on the problems that are in our path, we need to remember to keep our perspective. There is more to life than this. Isn't it so true? I'm sure all of us in this room can think back to problems that we faced, whether health problems or financial problems, and the Lord has graciously taken us through them. And now looking back on them, maybe a few decades later, we can say, they weren't that big. The Lord was still faithful. He got us through. And yet at the time when you're about to go through the tunnel, they seem so difficult and so challenging. Don't we need to ask him for that right perspective? And I love the promise in the book of James that anyone who's lacking wisdom can ask God who gives liberally and without reproach. If you need that perspective right now to see that life is more than whatever it is you're tempted to worry about, ask God for that wisdom, ask God for that perspective and ask in faith because he will answer. Thirdly, our God is a caring God. This is the third reason why we don't need to worry. Our God is a caring God. Look at how Jesus directs the gaze of the people listening to what is around them. He says, look at the birds of the air. Not just, hey, look at them. He's saying, consider them. Think about these birds. They do not sow. They do not reap. They do not store away in barns. Jesus is putting these things in terms that people will understand. Of course, sowing, reaping, and gathering away was a big part of the culture. Maybe if Jesus was speaking to us today in our Western culture, he might have said, look at the birds of the air. They do not have mortgages or careers or pensions, yet your heavenly father feeds them and gives them their nests and their food. How many times have you ever seen a bird sitting there fretting about what they're going to eat the next day? Today when we left our house, we put our cat out in the back garden and he just looked calm as always. He didn't realize we're going away for the day. During lockdown, we've become quite close to him and he's become quite close to us. But we didn't see him worrying about what he's going to eat next. We've left enough food out for him. Hopefully the neighbor's cat won't eat it. Animals don't worry about the future. They just focus on what they're doing next the lord provides for them i've never seen a bird worrying about how they're going to teach their hatchling to fly how they're going to put their kids through school worrying about their feathers falling out and finding a mate before they become too unattractive no birds just get on with it martin luther i'm sure many of you have heard of him in his autobiography he says I have one preacher I love better than any other. It is my little tame Robin who preaches to me daily. I put his crumbs upon my windowsill, especially at night. He hops onto the sill whenever he's hungry, eats as much as he wants, and then hops to a little tree close by, lifts up his voice to God, sings his carol of praise and gratitude, tucks his head under his wing, and goes to sleep, leaving tomorrow to look after itself. Consider the birds. And if you look at verses 28 to 30, Jesus gives another example of the natural world. He says, why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Again, being on the mountainside, you can imagine they would have been able to look around and see the birds in the sky and the wild flowers on the mountainside and the grass. And Jesus says, look, these things are so beautiful and yet they do not 
worry. They do not toil and spin. They do not have to go shopping in Primark for their clothes. They are just beautiful because God provides them. Solomon, one of the greatest, finest, richest kings that ever lived in all his splendor did not look as beautiful as these wild flowers which are here one day and gone the next. They don't do anything and yet God clothes them. Will he not much more clothe you? My friends, it is so important that in the midst of our worries that we stop and consider the world around us. The things that God has given to show us as, as testimonies of his faithfulness and his goodness. Every time you see a bird, every time you see a flower, remember Matthew 6. Remember how God has provided for them. Now you might be thinking, <clears throat> well hang on a second. Birds do starve sometimes. You know, sometimes animals do starve. Sometimes plants die. Looking at the news in recent weeks, Christians, you know, some throughout the ages have struggled, have been hungry and cold. If you look at the list that the Apostle Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians, he did struggle. And sometimes, and I know that I, I've been tempted to do this myself in the past, you can say, well, yes, I know God is capable of providing for me, but what if he doesn't? What if I'm one of the people who he allows to suffer and to struggle? Well, notice in this passage that Jesus isn't saying that if we trust in God, our lives will be trouble-free. Notice at the end of verse 34, he says, each day has enough trouble of its own. Difficulties do happen. We all know that. Everyone in this room can testify to the words that Jesus says in uh, John when he says, in this world you will have trouble. But what the point of this passage is telling us is that the same God who is able to care for his birds and his plants is able to provide for you in times of suffering. And either way, there's not much point worrying about it, is there? Fourth point, and of course this follows on from the third one. So the third one shows us, nature shows us that God cares. Fourth point is that he values you and me far more than he values the birds or the plants. Okay, so Jesus is making a point. He provides for the birds, he provides for the plants, and fourth point, he cares for you and I so much more than the birds and the plants. In Genesis 1, 26, when God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, we see something that sets humanity apart from every other created thing. We are made in the image of God. Which is why Jesus in Matthew 6, 26 can say, are you not much more valuable than they? My friends, we as human beings have been blessed in an extraordinary way because we have been made in the image of God. And God values every single one of us so greatly and I think when we go through times of worry when we go through times of suffering it can be so easy to let that temptation into our heads of does God really care about me does he really love me well of course don't we know the antidote to that is just to look to the cross if you ever want to know how much God loves you how much God values you all you need to do is look to the cross where his one and only son, perfect, innocent, spotless and holy, was sent to die, that you and I might be redeemed. God loves you so much. And if he's able to provide for his birds and his plants, who he loves less than us, can we not trust ourselves in our worries to his care, to his love, to his compassion? Then verse 27 the fifth reason why we should not worry. Jesus says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Number five, worry doesn't or cannot change anything. 
Most translations here have gone with a cubit to his lifespan or an hour to his life. A cubit was about 18 inches. And so to say which of you by worrying can add 18 inches to his height or an hour to his life, it doesn't make much sense. So that's why the, uh, the, the modern translations have gone for a single hour to his life. But Jesus is making the point here that worrying does not help us in any way. We, by worrying, cannot add a single second to our lives. We cannot add a minute, an hour, a week, a month. In fact, let's be honest, if we've allowed stress and worry to start you know, oppressing us in our lives, we're probably reducing our lifespan, aren't we? Because it can have such an effect on the body. And you know, looking back at my life, I can think of no instance where allowing myself to worry about something has ever actually solved a problem. I can think of many times when it's caused me lack of sleep, when it's undermined my faith in God, when it has led me into thoughts of hopelessness. What would happen if we decided to convert all the time we spent worrying into faithful prayer to God. Doesn't Paul tell us in that famous verse in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Of course, it is right for us to take thought for the future. I think the book of Proverbs tells us that, um, you know, you should know the state of your flocks and the state of your herds. You know, we should make thought um, for the future, but worrying is not productive. Taking our cares and anxieties to God, who we've already established loves us and cares for us so much, can achieve so much more than pointless anxiety. And this leads on to the sixth point in verses 31 and 32. Jesus says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. My friends, worrying impacts your testimony. And this is a hard thing to say in some ways, because often when somebody is facing worries or anxieties or a problem, and they want to indulge in a bit of worry, so many people are quick to comfort them and say, yes, yes, I can understand you. But no, Jesus says here, it affects your testimony as believers. Why? Well, Firstly, every human being knows, need, knows that they need these things. We know we need food. We know we need shelter. We know we need clothing. And Jesus is saying, look, everyone else is running after these things. And that's true, isn't it? When we look at the society around us, everyone is running after money and good health, long life and families and possessions. And so if your primary concern in your life is your health, your clothing, your money, your job, whatever it is, how are you any different from those people out there who have not had their lives changed by Jesus? If you are worrying about the same things, if you are chasing after the same things, you are not in any way set apart from they are. How can you honestly say that Jesus is the Lord of your life when you're acting like every other person out there who does not believe in him. As human beings, it is our natural inclination to run after these things. Of course it is, because we know that we need them. But you know what? So does God. God's made you. Imagine a car. Imagine the designer of a car not knowing what sort of fuel that car takes or what pressure the tires need to be. Of course the designer knows, because the designer has painstakingly designed the car. They'll know everything about it. And in the same way, God knows everything about you. He knows all of your needs. All of us in this room are at different stages of life, and with those different stages will come different needs. Some of you might be wondering, am I ever going to meet that right person for me? Some of you may be wondering, at what age I'm going to die? My friends, the Lord knows your needs he knows every single one of you he knitted every single one of you together in your mother's womb he knows the span of your life he knows the days that he has planned for you and he knows your needs better than you know your needs yourself in verse 8 of Matthew 6 when um, he's about to teach his disciples the Lord's prayer Jesus says do not be like them 
for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Isn't that a wonderful encouragement for prayer? That before we even go to God and ask him for things, he knows what you need. In the same way any parents here often knows what they, know what their children need before their children ask for them. And so there is no point worrying about these things. Cast your anxiety on him, as 1 Peter 5, 7 says, because he cares for you. My friends, make the decision in your life to set yourselves apart. When your co-workers are lamenting the state of the country or worrying about the future or worrying even about maybe something that's going on at your job or maybe if you're worrying about a new change in life that you're about to go through if you're about to start secondary school or university whatever it is there are countless other people in the country who are worried about the same things but you as a believer should be set apart from that yes you face the same challenges yes you face the same uncertainties but you know Jesus And because of what God has done for you, because he loves you, because he knows your needs, you can look forward to that uncertain future and say, I don't know what's going to happen, but God does. And God has promised to work all things together for my good. Now, that might not be my definition of good, but it's his definition of good. And his definition of good is my ultimate good. And so I can trust in him for that. This brings us to our final point. And I'll recap them all at the end, just in case um, you need to be reminded of them. But reason seven, why we should not worry. And this is uh, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. All of these things will be given to you as well. The seventh reason we shouldn't worry is because we should be concerned with something far greater. We should be seeking something far greater. Do you know, in the first year that I was in Afghanistan, my God, small g, was chasing combat. It sounds a, a bizarre thing, but I had tremendously fallen away from God before I, I went to Afghanistan. And when I went there, I was desperate to get into combat and to film it because I knew that if I filmed that stuff, it'd be shown all over the world. And, you know, it'd be great and I'd get glory from it and... Everywhere I went for that first year, whether I was in Helmand, which was you know, a really rough area, or, or anywhere else, it would just be silent, peaceful. You know, If you'd cloned me and spread me throughout the country, the war would have finished in the day, because everywhere I went, there was just nothing going on. And I'd been there a year, and it was my birthday, and I got my small camouflage Bible out, and I hadn't even read it that year. I, I, I'd completely fallen away from the Lord. And I turned to uh, both two passages, Prodigal Son and this um, passage, and the Lord just convicted me so powerfully of how far I had fallen from him and how I was chasing this earthly glory and the things of this world. And I, w- I was moved to tears. I was so regretful of how I'd wasted that year, of how I had acted like everybody else. And I said, Lord, I don't care what I film anymore because there was a team of four of us and we had to film everything that went on in the country. The bad stuff, the good stuff, like girls being allowed to go to school, wells being built. And I said, Lord, if I have to film wells and schools for the rest of my time here, I'm fine with that because being right with you, seeking your kingdom first is so much more important and so much more fulfilling than anything else on this earth. And for the first time that year, I had a wonderful peace just knowing that I was right with God again that Jesus uh, had because of what Jesus had done on the cross that my sins all the things I'd done that year my godless behavior was forgiven and it's funny that a few weeks later I ended up in some quite heavy combat and my footage was shown all over the world but you know what it didn't matter anymore why because being right with God seeking his kingdom first was so much more fulfilling And my friends, I want to tell you right now, whatever it is you're running after in life, it could be that you're in the position I was there, you know, maybe you've made a profession of faith, you you say you're a Christian, but your heart has become cold, and you're now running after other things, you're chasing after the things of this world. My friends, you will not find any satisfaction in those things. Why do we, why is it that we see so many broken celebrities, Hollywood stars with dissolving marriages, the people who have ended their own lives even? When we look at them and say they're they're good looking, they've got money, they're famous, like that's all somebody could want. And yet that isn't because they get that stuff and they realize they're still empty. My friends, as Christians, we are not to run after these things. We are to seek God, to seek his kingdom. Ask yourself, 
How does the way I think, the time I devote to thinking, the way I spend my money, the way I spend my time, what does that say about what you're seeking? It's so easy for us to come to church and say, yes, I'm seeking God and his kingdom first. But really, if you were to look at your bank balance, if you were to look at the way you spend your time each week, the way you think, that shows what you're really seeking. My friends, the wonderful promise here in verse 33 is that if you seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, which means you seeking his kingdom, the building of his kingdom on this earth, seeking how he can use you to extend his kingdom on this earth and his righteousness, so you're seeking to be more and more holy each day, not earning your salvation. We know that Christ has done it all. But a great part of the Christian life is ongoing sanctification, isn't it? It's becoming more like Christ every single day. And my friends, if you seek after those things, you can trust in God to take care of all the rest of it. You know, thinking about those um, soldiers who are being evacuated at the moment, they have one job to do. They, their job was to do what the army tells them. And in return, they trust that the army will provide them transport, the army will provide them food, the army will provide them accommodation, everything else, so they can just focus on doing what they need to do. My friends, that is what it's like for the Christian. If you seek God and his kingdom first, you do not need to worry about anything else because he has promised to provide for you. No, I'm not saying, okay, great, I want a Ferrari, I'm going to put God first and he'll give me one. No, in the same way that some of, you know, my little boy Jesse, you've seen him scampering around today, he thinks he needs chocolate, he calls it num-num. He thinks he needs num-num just before he goes to bed. I know as his father, he doesn't need num-num before he goes to bed. We so often think we need these things and we think, oh, you know, there's, I'm, I'm the pastor of a, an African church. Uh, we're the only white family in our church. Everyone else is from different parts of Africa. It's amazing i love them so much and it's just so good to see what god has been doing in our church but many of them when we first started were from this sort of health wealth and prosperity background i'm sure you've heard of it these tv preachers with private jets who stand up and say oh if you trust in god and give money to this ministry god will give you all the stuff that you need he'll give you luxury and no that's not what he promises he promises to take care of your needs and my friends if you put him first you can trust in him. And again, your version of what you need might be different to his version of what you need, but you can trust in him to provide every single thing for you. And so in conclusion, what have we said this morning? What have we looked at? Seven reasons why we shouldn't worry. The first one, which really can be the only one, <laughs> if you want, Jesus commands us not to worry. That should be good enough for us. Jesus knows what's best for us. We can trust him with that. Secondly, there is more to life than whatever it is we're currently worried about. Ask God for the right perspective if you're feeling tunnel visioned into your problem. Thirdly, the evidence that God cares is all around us in creation, the birds and the plants. Fourthly, out of all of his creation, God loves us the most. Fifthly, worrying doesn't solve anything you can't add a single hour to your life by worrying sixthly we can damage our testimonies to non-christians by worrying just like they do and seventhly we are to seek first the kingdom of god and let him take care of our needs because he knows what they are to close um when i was in afghanistan i attended uh, sometimes the there was an underground church for missionaries and for um other people that would attend and it was a, a strange thing to, because you wouldn't know where you were going to meet each week they would send a sort of coded email round, and they had five different locations and you would just turn up at that location for the Sunday and the notices because I think most services um, begin with notices the notices would begin with if somebody comes in shooting this is where to run uh, which direction to run out in but working uh, with the church and meeting some um, Christians I came across a, a guy called Najib um, who was an Afghan Christian who had his father executed in front of him for showing the Jesus film. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Jesus film in his village, and his father had, uh, was executed by the Taliban. And Najib fled from uh, the village from many of his family who also wanted to kill him because Najib had a dream of Christ and, and, and came to know Christ because of this. And I, I was trying to bring him supplies and meet up with him in Kabul, the capital city. And I said to him once, Najib, do you ever worry about your future? You know, compared to us, he had no prospects he had no future to speak of that we could see from an earthly perspective. And he said this to me. He said, sometimes, yes, I do worry. But when I do, I remember that Jesus is my Lord. 
and that he has got a bright tomorrow already for me. It may not be in 24 hours or even 24 years, but I know that he will bring me through to brighter times, even if I don't get to see them in this life. That is why I do not worry. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you so much for your graciousness to us. Lord, you know that every single one of us in this room have given in to our worries and our anxieties at some point. We might even be in the process of doing that now. Lord, I know many in this room are facing new changes and challenges. Lord, I just pray you would help us to remember the words of Matthew 6. Help us, Lord, that when you say, therefore I say to you, do not worry, Lord, you're saying that because you know what's best for us. Lord, help us to understand that life is so much bigger than the things we're worried about. Even if the things we're worried about are a, a, a terminal um, <clears throat> illness or something like that, Lord, help us to understand that life and eternity, Lord, help us to have the right perspective. Our life consists in so much more than what we own or what we wear or the car that we drive or even our own health. Lord, we thank you that the evidence that you care for this world is all around us. We thank you, Lord, that birds and cats and plants do not worry about how you're going to provide for them or what you're going to clothe them in. And Lord, we are made in your image. Lord, it blows my mind that you love us so much. You've made us in your image despite of all of, all of your creation. We are the ones who reject you again and again. And yet for us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we we, we, we humble ourselves at your feet. You are so good to us. You are so loving. And we thank you that you love us, Lord. Lord, help us to understand that worrying does not solve anything. Lord, help us to be constructive with the times we're tempted to worry. Help us to turn them into prayer, into faithful trust of you, knowing that you work all things for our good. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be mindful of our testimonies before non-Christians. Lord, if we're moaning and complaining and worrying, at, because that's what British people like to do in our workplaces around other people, Lord, help us not to do that. Help the way we live our lives be a powerful testimony to the faith we have in God. May those in our families and our uh, workplaces who don't know you see that we are different, that we are facing the same uncertain futures that they are, but we trust in a great God. And Lord, I pray that every single one of us in this room would seek first your kingdom that your righteousness that living in a way that pleases you that seeking the extension of your kingdom on this earth would be our number one priority lord that our time and our money and our efforts and our affections and our thoughts would be geared towards this to glorifying you and honoring you in all of our ways so that we can just leave everything else to you and trust in you to provide for what we need because you are good and you are faithful. Lord, be with us and help us to trust in you and not to worry. We ask all of this in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're going to finish by closing, what a faithful God have I. And that's true, isn't it? Our God is so faithful and good to us. Thank you. Amen. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. I find rest in your presence and fullness of joy. In worship and wonder, I behold your face, singing, what a faithful God have I.
thank you very much for Josh for uh, bringing that uh, message to us. Uh, I'm sure you'll be hanging around for a bit after the service if people want to, to talk with him, get to know him before uh, breakaway or discuss uh, the, the deep message that he brought to us about uh, God's faithfulness to us and how we shouldn't worry. So let's just uh, close our service then by saying the grace uh, together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.